Okay, and now I'm going to start. Okay, looks like we're live. Uh, attendees have started to uh, to join, so um, give a few seconds for everybody to to get in the Zoom. My name is Kelvin Harris. I'm the director of outreach and engagement for the Cook County Assessor's Office. Uh, so I'm going to be facilitating tonight um, with uh, with our host Fritz Fritz Kagi, uh, the assessor. Um, so. Um, Whenever you're ready, Fritz, uh, you can go ahead and, and kick it off and start introductions. Well, hey, uh, Kelwin, thank you for the introduction. And everyone, thanks for joining us today. This is the latest in our series, uh, which has been going on for almost two years, talking about racial equity in real estate and all the different things that impact it. Um, and the conversation we're having today, it focuses on the undervaluation of black and brown communities through biased appraisals. Um, we'll also talk about how other biases affect things like assessments, which we've talked about on previous series in this, in this series, about how both of these things, biased appraisals, biased assessments, lead to disinvestment. And much has been talked about the appraisal gap, and we have two great experts here today. What is the appraisal gap? It's where Black families have been appraised lower than when they took down pictures. we are basically appraised lower uh, when uh, uh, they took down pictures that express racial identity and other indicators of race and then received higher appraisals. So there were things that seemed to exhibit evidence of bias um, in undervaluation of Black people's homes, which reduces their access to our federal mortgage finance system, which is uh, a big benefit that the government provides that helps people build equity, but it can lead to inequitable access if appraisals are biased. We also know that investing by banks and other uh, lenders in Chicago has been uneven with black communities receiving a fraction of the investment that white ones receive. And unequal appraisals lead to unequal lending and it continues to widen, widen existing disparities. And our fundamental questions that we have today are, why are appraisals in black communities not always the same as those in white ones? And why is lending in white communities a fraction of other neighborhoods? Um, as always, we'll not only identify problems, but also focus on solutions. Um, and then I can weave in a little bit about how a tax assessment gap has been as big a problem um, as the tax appraisal gap, um, sort of, and it's driven by some of the same biases. So let me introduce our panelists today. First of all, you know, we're all honored to have these experts joining us here. It's a real privilege. First of all, we have Andre Perry. He's a senior fellow at Brookings Metro and a scholar in residence at American University. He's the author of Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Properties in America's Black Cities. And his research fo focuses on race and structural inequality, education and economic inclusion in black majority cities and institutions all across America focusing on valuable assets worthy of increased investment. He's testified before Congress about appraisal disparities in our country. He's one of the leading experts in this problem. Alden Lowry is a senior editor of Race, Class, and Communities with WBEZ. There, he provides enterprise reporting on numerous areas, including housing, immigration, and employment. Previously, he served as the Director of Research and Evaluation for the Metropolitan Planning Council for two years, and there he examined and wrote about population loss, demographic shifts, job trends, and racial segregation. He's also been an investigator and policy analyst for the Better Government Association. And then James Eric Smith serves as Secretary for the Chicago Chapter of the Appraisal Institute which is a global professional association of real estate appraisers. They have nearly 20,000 professionals in almost 60 countries around the world, and they offer an array of professional education and advocacy programs. James has a 25-year career in the design and construction industry and an 18-year career in the real estate industry. James is a licensed appraiser in Illinois and Indiana and holds the senior residential designation. 
So without any further ado, I want to hand this over to Andre for his opening remarks. Let me just jump in really quick, uh, Fritz, remind folks. Uh, Alden Lowry uh, is not here, but he will be. Uh, he's running about uh, 15 minutes late. I had to drop a daughter off at, uh, at school, uh, but Alden will be here. Uh, also, there's a, a Q&A box in the bottom of your chat. Uh, feel free to drop questions in uh, you know, while Andre talks or at any point uh, during the discussion tonight. Now, it's just a little housekeeping. Uh, over to you, Andre. Hey, no problem. And, and thank you, um, Kelwin, and, and certainly thank you, um, Fritz. And, and it is a pleasure to, to talk with you and um, with James today. Um, it's deeply an honor. I'm going to actually share a screen, um, which really does introduce the, the, the meat of my work. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to see it. Hopefully, it's on the screen now. Um, uh, Fritz, give me a nod if you see it. Yes. Um, at the Brookings Institution, I study the value of assets in Black majority neighborhoods and cities. Um, and one of the most valuable assets that we know of in terms of its importance is, is housing. Um, on this chart, you'll see the average list price of homes in um, neighborhoods. Um, on that x-axis, that horizontal axis, uh, horizontal line, that's the share of the Black population in a zip code. And on the y-axis, as indicated by the price on top of the bars, that's the average list price in a neighborhood. And we use both Zillow and census data to, to get a sense of how, how, what's the average price in these neighborhoods. And as you can see, in neighborhoods where the share of the Black population is less than a percent, on average, they're about $340,000 across the country. And as the share of the black population increases, the price goes down, the um, average list price goes down to the point where in neighborhoods that are 50% or higher, the average list price are about half as much as those where there are few to, to know um, black people about $184,000 using Zillow data. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of education, that's because of crime. Well, those are things you can control for in a study and that's what we did. We got that absolute price and we control for structural characteristics. So square footage, number of rooms, all the physical manifestation. What I mean by control, we um, are trying to create an apples to apples comparison, twins, so to speak, um, between homes in, in different neighborhoods. But then we control for neighborhood amenities, education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics. So we could get an apples to apples comparison. And what we found is that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. So that 50% difference that I noted dropped down to 23% after attending to those variables. So, uh, you know, I always got to remind people when they see this research, education does matter. Crime does matter. But you, after you tend to those things, there's still a gap. And that amount um, accumulatively across the country leads to about 156 billion in lost equity across the, the United States, 156 billion. Wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where devaluation is occurring. Wherever you see a green circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are on average priced higher than their white counterparts in a metro. Chicago metro, for instance, about there's a negative 28% difference, about 36, about 37,000 per home. Just to give people some perspective, in Lynchburg, Virginia, Lynchburg, if you helicoptered the home in a black neighborhood and dropped it in a similarly situated neighborhood, so it, it would, similar school district, similar crime rates, it would increase in value by 81%. Rochester, New York, 65% difference. Jacksonville, 47. Again, um, Chicago, 28% uh, difference. And again, there are places where black neighborhood homes in black neighborhoods are on average price higher. Um, Boston, plus 23%. I always got to remind people that Boston's no less racist than Lynchburg, but the home prices are higher. But I just want to put that in perspective so people can take this away. What is 156 billion? 
156 billion would have financed more than 4 million black owned businesses based upon the average amount black people use to start their firms. It would have paid for more than 8 million four year degrees based upon the average amount of a four year public education. Replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3000 times over and is, um, um, would have covered nearly all of Hurricane Katrina damage. It's double the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. It's a big number. This is why I say that there's nothing wrong with black people within that ending racism can't solve. I know in Chicago, there is a big conversation and we should have a big conversation about crime. But when we talk about crime, let's not forget about the structural um, causes for it. If, 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 if home values are not, uh, are not at this uh, rate that they should be, municipalities are you losing critical resources used um, to uplift their residents and residents are losing um, critical resources to uplift themselves. So I'm gonna end there um, for now, but um, that's the nature of my work and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later. But um, one thing I do wanna point out that value gap um, is not just about appraising. I just wanna be clear about that that there are lots of things in the market that lead to that value gap. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I do, I mean, uh, a lot of appraisers uh, um, got me wrong. I, I try not to um, scapegoat. And I do think there's a lot of scapegoating on appraisers and not the overall um, actors within a market and some with the, out, outside of the housing market. So I'm gonna leave it there. Um, and thank you very much for, for having me. All right, Andre, that is a great starting point and a good reminder that there are multiple different biases that come together that are layered on top of each other um, in all sorts of economic markets and situations, and real estate is just one of the most obvious ones. Um, so here, James, I'm going to hand it off to you from the Appraisal Institute, and then uh, and then we'll see if we got Alden in the house. Great, thank, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, first off, um, hello everyone. Um, oh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, I guess I can say it uh, without being uh, uh, in some sort of conflict with the Appraisal Institute. Uh, uh, Assessor, uh, congratulations on your primary. Um, you know, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, my name is James Eric Smith. Um, and, you know, my background, and I want to start there because I'm going to say some things, I, I guess, during this program that, that may be eye-opening to some. Um, I have an architecture engineering degree from North Carolina A&T State University and a value engineering certification from North Carolina State. Um, I practice in the design and construction industry for you know, 25 years. I'm still practicing in the design and construction industry through TSC Development, uh, one of my corporations I have. Um, I spent... Uh, a lot of time uh, in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the corporate world, just looking at real estate, let's say, but it's mainly been on the commercial side. But, um, you know, some of the, com the components you have on the commercial side is, is there on the residential side. So I can speak to residential. Um, going forward, you know, I got into the, uh, um, real estate business through, through a friend saying you would be good at it. So I picked up uh, my managing broker's license. So I'm, a, I'm also a um, um, managing real estate broker. And also, um, well, I graduated from North Carolina T with an engineering degree. So have, I'm a licensed professional engineer. Uh, uh, and, you know, I cover all services, uh, communication, uh, HVAC, uh, and, and all of these energy things that uh, we're talking about in new homes that are going in new homes. And, you know, so now let's get, let me move forward because I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm the secretary 
of the Chicago chapter of the Appraisal Institute. Um, in on there, like like uh, Assessor Kagi uh, said, uh, we offer a lot of programs um, and um, courses to ensure that uh, members and the appraisers at large are, you know, are, are well educated on the appraisal uh, the appraisal business and how you go about appraising real property. Um, I think I think um, there needs to be. Um, well, let me back up and say there is conversation within the within the appraisal institute uh, about racial bias. There is, and it's it's being taken serious. I, you know, I can say that because I'm involved in it, and I and I see and I see what's happening. It's ha happening on the national level, and it's also happening on the local level here in Chicago. Uh, we've initiated a committee on racial bias, and we're going to have uh, uh, homegrown seminars and discussions on this because we want everyone to have trust uh, with appraisers in the industry. Okay, um, where, is 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 that enough to start to to, to start with? We've got a lot of good material here to start with, James, and I think we'll like to dig into those solutions because, as I mentioned at the start uh, in this series, we 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 like to put a spotlight on problems, dig into them, but we don't want to stop there. We think we're we're not doing our job if we only stop there. We want to talk to solutions. And James, I think you you uh, you you've sort of uh, led us off into a discussion on uh, on finding solutions for some of these problems, and I can. I could talk. I could tell you a little about before before um, before Alden gets here. Um, you know how we come at this problem in, in the world of assessments, but how that can also lead. You know, we experience some of the same issues that appraisers have, um, but then it can lead to things that lead to um, tax burdens being unfair in um, in a the in the way we tax property it's sort of a mirror image of this appraisal gap and the appraisal gap that people talk about they say that they're for whatever reason whether the bias is intentional or unintentional or if it's just a reflection of the embedded racism that's in housing markets for whatever reason um homes in black communities are appraised lower than uh values than values in other communities and that leads to less access to mortgage finance in our mortgage finance system. And it can be perceived to, and it can, you know, all sorts of studies have shown that it can, uh, in, you know, hurt the wealth creation and access to, to federal finance and, and home, home equity uh, for everyone, which is, you know, what our, our country is supposed to be about. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, how do we fix that? And I think we'll talk more about that, James. Um, and I think uh, uh, Alden can speak to this. Um, is how we how we fix that. What are some of the ways that we can address this when we identify the source of, of some of the problems that that Alden's found? But uh, what I can say is that from the ass tax assessment point of view, we kind of have a mirror image problem. When in in appraisals, there tends to be a bias that leads to undervaluation of Black people's homes. But when it comes to assessment, there are some biases or missing information that leads to overassessment, overvaluation, which leads to tax rates being too high uh, on Black people's homes. Um, why? Well, how does that happen? There have been study after study after study. We had Chris Berry at the University of Chicago show his research to us um, on an earlier um, episode of this series where he looked at assessment systems across America and he would sort of take a look at homes on the bottom end of the price spectrum and the top end of the price spectrum. And he'd see that the basically the more the lower your home value got in practically every city in America, the more it tended to be overassessed, that the assessor was overestimating the value of black people's homes. And that was leading to higher tax burdens than should be, than should be, sometimes by 20, 30, 40%. Um, and what was the cause of that? He said, well, there, there's some bad modeling there. 
Um, he, but he also said that, you know, assessors can't see inside people's homes. And he said that I think a big problem is that you, you don't have any information on condition and quality inside people's homes. Um, and so then homes at the bottom end of the price spectrum haven't been renovated as much. They might not have had as much upkeep. So you're probably overestimating their value. Um, and, you know, one of the problems that we think we can address is by assessors around the country getting access to this federal mortgage appraisal da database so that we would have information about interior quality and condition. So it leads to less um, uh, over assessment. And how does over assessment hurt the value of people's homes that Andre is talking about? Well, anytime you have over assessment. Can we jump in at any time? Yeah, that means tax rates are too high and higher tax rates lowers the value of people's homes. Um, it's a very predictable relationship. In our state, we have another layer of bias. All these biases can be stacked on top of each other. In this state, we put more burden on local school districts for financing the education of their children through property taxes than any other place in the nation. Uh, in Illinois, about 25% of school districts' budgets are covered by state funding. Another 10% comes from federal government but the rest has to be made up by local school districts taxing their own property. And when you have a racial pattern of population and you have racial patterns of bias in housing markets, that means that black people's homes, because they're 28% less valued, as, as Andre said, uh, they basically structurally have to pay a higher tax burden to cover the cost of educating their children than other communities do. In some parts of Cook County, tax rates are six times what they are in the city of Chicago. For a $100,000 home, you're paying taxes that are six times as high for the same $100,000 home in Chicago. And that is very destructive to housing values. I think that's one of the causes of the disparities in housing values that Andre's talking about. It's a big destroyer of Black people's wealth. And I think, you know, the last part that I want to add in this conversation, now we can start talking about solutions and we can talk to Alden, is that, you know, Black people, although they have been hurt by uh, um, their house, her housing equity, by all these different biases that they're talking about, still, despite all of that, Black people have more of their wealth invested in real estate than any other racial group. So Black people really have a lot on the line in terms of fixing these problems so that they can realize the same gains in, in the savings that they've made um, that, that every, the rest of America has had these, this access to. So that's why it's so important. So do we have Alden here now, Colin? Yes, we yes, do. Yes, I, I, okay. I think I see him. Uh, welcome, Alden. All right, so um, we're... Um, Alden, we're just in the opening statement here uh, phase here. I sort of led into you. Uh, we had Andre talk about how even when you control for education and crime and other factors, housing values for Black people's homes is structurally lower than it is um, in, in, uh, in, in other communities all across America. He laid out compelling research on there. And then James uh, Eric Smith from the Appraisal Institute talked about how you know his experience in the appraisal industry and it's going to kick off a discussion later about what folks in the industry are doing to assess perceived biases. And so Alden, maybe this is a good way to, to hand it off to you, what you found in your research and tell us a little bit about what you've discovered. Sure. Uh, first, just uh, my apologies. Um, I, my uh, middle daughter is uh, starting school at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was getting registered and everything today and things took a little longer than we thought. Um, but uh, uh, we've done um, at the WBEZ a uh, big project uh, in 2020 looking at mortgage lending and um, essentially it was an assessment of home purchase loans uh, across the industry uh, in the city of Chicago. And uh, our, our, our main finding was that uh, lending to uh, majority white census tracts uh, was uh, much higher than it was in majority black and majority Latino census tracts to the tune of uh, about eight to one. Um, and uh, the thing that when we talked with people about uh, what were some of the factors, there was uh, certainly a discussion that the, the values of, of, of homes in, in, in majority white areas are, are typically higher, but, but not eight to nine times higher. 
And when we looked at specific lenders, uh, Chase Bank was the most notable, but Bank of America guaranteed rate and a number of other major lenders had disparities that were far higher than that eight to, eight to one, nine to one ratio. It was 40 to one in the case of Chase Bank. And uh, so just offered a lot of questions about the level of uh, investment that the banks were providing or not providing um, and how that investment or that overinvestment contributes to this problem of, of, of value. Um, places that are getting hundreds of millions of dollars. There were four majority white uh, community areas in Chicago that had more home purchase lending than the totality of all black uh, neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. And so when you can have that kind of investment pouring into specific communities, uh, it certainly uh, increases the value, the buzz, the interest uh, in a number of players across the private sector uh, that want to do business there, that want to live there, and the amount of money that they'll spend uh, to, uh, to anchor themselves there, whereas communities that are not getting that kind of investment have a very hard time keeping the value uh, up in the properties that are, that are already, already there, let alone uh, trying to build or construct more. So uh, that, that was our, our big entree uh, most recently, um, but I've done previous mortgage lending analyses where we were actually looking at um, the actual outcomes of, um, uh, of uh, loan applications. Um, it was some years ago, but uh, there was a discovery that fewer than 50% of uh, loan applications uh, in the Chicago metro area from African-American borrowers uh, turned into originations. Um, and so they were turned down more often. But one of the other interesting findings was 15% of those applications ended up either being withdrawn or just didn't go anywhere. Uh, so they didn't even get to a point where the bank made a decision about the loan. And in talking with people about that, one of the things that we heard was that uh, sometimes those deals just fell through, uh, particularly at the, the, uh, the, the point of an appraisal. And so the fact that we're talking about appraisals today, uh, it ties into the lending as well, because if there is a hiccup with uh, an appraisal, uh, and, and we found uh, in a separate story that, uh, that we did just last year um, that Natalie Moore did for us, uh, looking at um, discrimination in appraisals, uh, primarily on in terms of the appraised values coming in a lot lower than the list price. And that this being a particular problem that real estate brokers uh, were telling us uh, in black Chicago. Uh, but a lot of those deals just don't go through because the, the borrower is just not happy with the appraisal. Um, and ultimately they don't get the kind of loan that they were looking for and they say, never mind. Um, or that the seller is like, you know, we're not going to get uh, the, the, the price that we want because the appraisal is coming in too low. And so they just walk away from the deal. And so, you know, thinking back to the analysis that I was a part of many years ago when I was at the Chicago Reporter, uh, seeing that all of these loan applications from black borrowers, you know, one out of every seven or so, uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, the appraisals and the problem with appraisals, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, had a had a big role in that. So, um, this is all a factor in, in a range of issues that affects uh, Black communities, and uh, there's no clear answer, I think. Um, but uh, one of the things that just seems to show itself uh, over and over again is the fact that Black borrowers and Black communities are viewed differently, treated differently, valued differently. And that's at the heart of all of the problems that I think we'll be talking about today. Well, Alden, I think your research, your research that you did uh, and Natalie did uh, is sort of, uh, uh, is definitely in the same ballpark to what Andre and the Brookings Institution's research has also found. Um, but James, you said, uh, you know, I, I want to get back to what you were just starting to, to get to in terms of the good stuff of, uh, um, you know, examining this problem uh, of, uh, you know, is there bias in appraisals? Where does it come from? Does it exist? Is it implicit or is it, or is there something in the culture? Tell us a little bit more, James, about what you and the, your colleagues are, are doing to, to examine this issue. Um, let me start out to say, um, I, I know bias has been part of the, uh, the uh, real estate uh, industry. Um, and for anyone to think that it hasn't and, and that it's gone away, because I do believe in some areas it, it still exists. Um, you know, from an, from an appraiser standpoint, and y'all bear with me for a minute because I want to try to lay something out here. That's okay, James. Take the time you need. This is the good stuff. 
from, from an appraisal standpoint, first and foremost, everybody's looking at the same data, okay? So that, that's how it's easy quantitatively to find out if somebody's racially biased, if there's an, a racially biased appraisal, because everybody's looking at the same data. It's how you interpret that data, okay? Uh, what do you see? What information do you get from the data, let's say? Um, th there are procedures for appraising property. You know, I, I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a managing real estate broker. You know, so if I talk about a real estate broker, I can because I'm one. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's a joke. I'm not talking about it. Um, it, it you have to understand the fundamentals of appraising real estate. When you're appraising property, it's, it's really a snapshot in time, okay? You can have three houses that sold, you know, for a lot of money, let's say. I want to I speak as general as possible. And you, get a, you go to get an appraisal on your property, and it's going to be reflective of those sales, those recent sales. Now, six months later, you can go get another appraisal and let's say three less value appraisals sold. I mean, property sold. Uh, well, your, your value is going to be based off of the most recent comps. Okay. Um, and I, I don't want to try to make this too confusing. For a lot of people, in, in, in um, a lot of people in general, they want to have, they want to live in a nice home. They're always improving their home. So when they go to sell, they, they, they believe that they have the best home in the neighborhood, which is okay. Um, you also have investors in the community um, that are buying property, fixing them up because uh, the market calls for some new product, modern product. But a lot of them are finding themselves, well, in times past, and I'm pretty sure it's going on today, not being able to uh, get the appropriate value, let's say, on their property, okay? And I want to say it that way because there's a lot of ways you can look at it, you know, everything going forward. Um, so... The principles have always been in place to appraise a property the same way. You may not come up with the same value, but the process has always been the same. And years ago, in, in the Appraisal Institute, and everything really came out of the um, savings and loan debunk, okay? Um, Uh, 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 how do I want to say this? Because, you know, I, I really want to get down into the issue where people think that their homes are, are being lowballed, let's say, rate because of racial bias. And there's a lot of ways you can look at it. Like I, like I was saying, and let me, I guess let me finish the, the, about the investor. So he fixed up his property and he has the best property in the neighborhood. Can't nothing compared to it. So what do you do? Do you penalize that person? No. You, there's principles, there's procedures of going outside of the neighborhood to compare that property. That's how communities grow, okay? And if, if everybody in the neighborhood has the same property, I mean, they're not, no one's fixing them up, then they're the same. Um, so I, I went the long way to say, Yes, there needs to be some more education uh, with regards to appraisers on, I guess, in a way to really eradicate all of those biases that appraisers used to have a long time ago when they walk into a, 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 a Black person's home, you know? I, and because it goes back to what I said earlier. Everybody's looking at the same data, okay? Everybody's looking at the same data. 
remember that anytime you get in a in a conversation or in a situation where you 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 uh you feel that you've been done wrong, just remember everybody's looking at the same data. So you can you can go find another appraiser, and I hate to say it that way. You can go and uh contract another appraiser to look at your property. Now <laughs> they're looking at the same data. So they should be coming back with the same information, pretty much. You know. Well, hey, James, that's a that's a really good uh you know, lead off to what Andre sort of mentioned at the end of his comments. Um, you know, Andre, you said that, you know, I think this problem goes way deeper than just appraisal bias and that you didn't think it was appropriate. You thought the industry you could even, you know, sometimes you could say was scapegoated that there are other causes. You know, if you had to identify, you know, the other causes, like, you know, I think that whenever, you know, whenever there's a situation where there's data, you know, what we do in our industry here in assessments is we always have to look to say, well, what data are we missing? Is there a pattern of bias that could be in the in the systems that we have or in the data that we do have or don't have? Uh, Andre, what are sort of the some, are some of the other kinds of biases that you see the causes for the disparities that you've identified in valuation? Yeah, and I, I just wanted to address some of the things that um, James stated. And when I uh, did uh, a hearing and I actually, um, um, with a, appraisers on this issue, um, after the hearing, many came up to me and said, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm following the rules. And I said, that is absolutely true. The, the problem is that if in the price comparison model that's generally used, there are other models, but mostly the price comparison model where homes are compared to others in a particular neighborhood to establish value. Why that is fraught, if you compare homes to another in a neighborhood that's been discriminated against historically, you effectively just recycle discrimination over and over and over again. You don't necessarily have to do anything wrong, but there has been a pattern set um, that, you know, and let's be, let's also be real. Um, um, appraising, appraising was a, one of the many tools that were, that um, were used to discriminate against black people. I mean, we, I mean, there's a long history of everything from appraising to um, bad lending practices to single family zoning ordinances. There's a whole suite of things that contributed to that. But I, I just wanted to state that because many, uh, when they hear bias appraisers, there's a defensiveness there. And sometimes there should be. Um, the, you know, Freddie Mac found that when you look at contract price, there's much more likely that black and brown communities have a lower con um, lower price there. But, and they use a different model. But um, uh, but uh, the reason why I don't try to point the finger at appraisers per se is because um, what many people will say is that 90% of appraisers are white, 75% are male there has to be a bias there. And there and there probably is a bias, but you could replace and diversify that entire field. If they're using the same practices, you're gonna get the same result. And so I try to make sure that we're talking about the structural practices, the, 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 what's structurally um, problematic. With that said, clearly, a lack of investment leads to a, um, um, a throttling of home values. Um, there was a, a recent, the LA Times just released a study or a report where they looked at um, school uh, bonds that were issued in building new schools. That led to higher home um, values. And so if you're not investing in a community, if municipalities aren't investing in a community, that's also a problem. Um, more lending, as was mentioned, lending is a form of investment in a community. It, if you're not lending in a community, you are, are won't be able to animate the 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 assets within that community. Um, Absolutely, Andre. Yeah, go on, and then I wanted to go to Alden. Oh yeah, I wanted to say, you know, what 
the lenders that he looked at, what do they say? And I, I just want to yeah. mention one, just one other. And real estate agent behavior, don't discount um, that group either. Steering still happens. So there's a, a range of actors and reasons why home values are lower, but those are just a few, and I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Alden. Uh, uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, uh, yeah, to your question, Fritz, uh, we didn't hear a whole lot from the lenders, but the, the, the folks that we did talk to, we, we talked to a couple off the record. Um, and so they point to, um, you know, they're, they're shiny uh, and, and very strong positive ratings uh, with the CRA, um, which is, uh, you know, a very kind of complex assessment um that and tell people what the cra is alden it comes uh, from chicago uh yes that's, as a matter of fact it does uh the community uh, reinvestment act um which is meant to be the kind of checks and balance against uh, discriminatory lending um it is in a nutshell um there is a, essentially a cra rating that the banks uh receive and that's based upon their lending, but also other ways in which they are contributing or, or investing in certain communities. And so uh, a number of ways that banks kind of boost their CRA ratings without lending in the way that we measured it is that they uh, they will give in a philanthropic way uh, to, uh, you know, to help, uh, you know, particularly low income communities or communities of color. Uh, or they will provide, uh, in some cases, uh, a ton of resources toward CDFIs and other small, uh, smaller lenders um, who, as a course in their mission, um, uh, you know, invest uh, greatly in, in, in low-income communities and communities of color, although the scale is, uh, you know, it's, it's microscopic compared to the, the amount of lending that, that the big banks do. But uh, those are all ways in which they uh, kind of help boost their CRA ratings. Uh, and also the CRA measures uh, uh, lending uh, essentially on a white versus non-white basis, which is, which is, I think, a way to kind of add some noise to uh, the struggles of lending uh, in uh, very predominantly black or predominantly brown communities, you know, 80, 90 percent black communities. Um, look a lot different than communities that are maybe 52% non-white, uh, but there may be 30 or 40% white. Um, so, uh, so the CRA is a, is a different way of measuring um, banks uh, and their lending and their commitment to, to communities of color. We went straight for the jugular, if you will, if we look at that these you know predominantly black and predominantly brown communities, what how much lending is happening there compared to majority white communities, and, and we saw those very wide gaps as we did, um, but uh, but that's what the banks usually were the ones that spoke with us. That that's what they leaned on when they so were so just so help help us help translate this for us, Alden. So when you show them this evidence that hey you're lending eight times as much to uh, these white communities as as poor black ones. They come back and they say our CRA score is good. They say our CRA score is good. They say we're uh, investing, uh, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, Chase uh, highlighted their uh, their forty million dollar investment in in uh, low income communities in Chicago. I think stretched out over a, a four or five year period of time. Um, in the story, we pointed out that if Chase uh, provided lending in black communities at the rate at the disparity that the industry was doing in Chicago, which was like I said, eight to one, close to nine to one for African-Americans. If they were investing at that level, instead of 40 to one, as, as they had been, uh, that sum of lending would, would have outpaced their $40 million philanthropic investment by tenfold. Um, so, you know, while $40 million sounds, and, 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 and believe me that it was a very welcome uh, addition uh, but uh, but lending is still primarily the way that banks can and should invest, and and specifically to Chase, they're they're just quite frankly not lending in Black Chicago, uh, not to the sum that they are in other parts of the city. Um, so, but those were some of the things that they told us. Uh, but the, the banks that did talk to us uh, refuted very strongly that there was any racial bias in their decision making. That they look at 
at, at borrowers, the what you know, you know, they look at, at at the paperwork, they look at the numbers, and they make a determination. Um, they talked about the historical struggles that 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 the, the industry has always had in terms of lending in, in, in communities of color and in low-income communities, but that they were making every effort uh, through, like I said, through philanthropic lending, through giving to small, small, smaller lenders uh, as a way to try to boost those investments. Uh, Chase even engaged in a number of community meetings with uh, local community leaders here in Chicago. Uh, to try to figure out ways in which they can uh, elevate their lending. And, um, and what we heard um, was that uh, the folks were underwhelmed by some of the uh, some of the the uh, propositions that Chase was offering. So this remains a problem area, but the banks, uh, as they have over many years, have have always said, you know we're we're doing the right things. This is just an incredibly difficult job uh, to uh, to lend in certain communities. And, and uh, Alden, you know the, uh... The Community Reinvestment Act is something that emerged from Chicago. It was activists on the West Side, I believe in the 60s and 70s, who saw the experience of inequitable access to federal mortgage uh, guarantees and financing. And we had, we had uh, kinds of predatory, so-called predatory uh, inclusion, like uh, contract, contract uh, buying and things like this that really hurt people. It didn't give people the same rights and opportunities that other people did who were using the the, the federally regulated mortgage infrastructure, but that so that that is something that you know the experience of Chicago helped to put into federal law. But one of the things is that, as I understand it, I believe seventy percent of mortgages of mortgage lending does not even come from banks anymore, and that it, it comes from these non-bank financial institutions like Quicken Loans. Yeah. Are they even subject to the CRA? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain of that. Um, we looked at the 15 largest lenders, uh, and this was lending that was reported through the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Um, that's a readily available data that journalists have used for decades now to uh, kind of peek in on what lending institutions are doing. I do believe Quicken Loans and those kinds of institutions are included in that data. I want to say I remember seeing their names, but they didn't make our top 15 list. I don't believe they made our top 15 list of lenders anyhow. Um, so okay, so uh, Andre, I wanted to 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 turn to you, and let's start getting to the solutions part of the discussion here, because I think all of you in different ways have identified disparities. You've spoken about disparities that we see in real estate markets, in financing, and valuation, um, and all of the folks who 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 join us here on these panels, we sometimes get the most productive part of this discussion out of solutions. So how, what are what are sort of the top solutions that you see in terms of addressing the valuation gap, the lending gap, the appraisal gap, whatever you want to call it, so that we have less disparities in valuation and access to financing um, and costs of maintaining a home? You know, and I'll, I'll go very um, general and then get to specifics. But in a nutshell, we get that equity that's lost um, from devaluation we've got to restore it to individuals um, first and foremost. I mean, to, to put, use the colloquialism, we got to cut the check, so to speak. Now, it, it's going to be hard to just, I mean, we should not just snap our fingers and raise home values. What we can do is give people down payment assistance. We What we can do are provide tax credit. What we can do is micro loans to folks to 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 help fix up their property. So that that loss of revenue in neighborhoods really um, prohibits people from doing all those things that can animate the assets in the neighborhood. And you know, and then there are just some very basic um, data things that we have to do. We we don't have to use a price comparison model anymore. <laughs> like I mean. And it's, it's both the, the promise and the biggest threat. We, we know that technology and um, desktop appraisals and um, um, value um, um, uh, AVMs um, um, are coming. Automated valuations are coming. That's going to happen. The problem, the, the promise is they can do like researchers do. They can widen the aperture and look at um, much a lot of data and find comparables homes and com and, and comparable uh, uh, neighborhoods, 
and, and get the data. The problem though with technology is um, programmers have the same biases as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So if the programs are not, or don't recognize the value, you can actually make matters worse through technology. But just as, you know, to, you know, I always try to use a comparison. There was a, um, a long standing history of taxis not going to black neighborhoods. Then Lyft and, and uh, Uber came along. Now they're dying to get into black. Mm -hmm. So technology often pushes the industry in positive ways, I, and I think. And then, then um, finally, it, it, and I think it's probably the biggest one, and it gets to what Alden's work gets to. You have got to lend to, um, but not just to anyone. We got to figure out a way to convert longstanding renters into homeowners, particularly in markets in which there's devaluation that oftentimes, and, th and this is a, a little known announcement that Freddie did maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, they announced that they're going to now experiment with using rent history um, to as a credit uh, mm -hmm. to replace a FICO score, a credit score, to, or use rent history as a credit score. Mm -hmm. Because the research shows there are many people um, between a um, a, a 600 and a 700 that are only there because they've never owned an asset. And the reason why they never owned an asset is because the, the discrim past discrimination. And so um, though many of those people live in communities have been renting in the neighborhoods for, for decades, they should be able to buy a home in those areas. So we need new mortgage products, um, but in a nutshell, we need to find ways to um, enable, to empower renters who should qualify for a home or mortgage in an area, particularly in areas where there's devaluation. But as you know, property values are now rising at phenomenal rates, and it's just making it much more harder for that to, to happen. So um, there are lots of strategies we can use. But at the end of the day, we got to figure out ways to, to get resources to individuals. <laughs> like, because if you, if you essentially take a opportunity zone approach and invest in brick and mortar, you'll raise values and people will eventually be pushed out. And so you got to figure out ways to, you know, restore the values that's been extracted by these practices. Well, uh, Andre, we can testify to you know how biases and modeling can lead to these disparities where you just think if you're just objective you think you're objectively looking at data but if you if you don't really inspect the methods you right. can get really tremendous biases and I'll give you an example of of one that that we discovered um you know when we came into this this office and it's one that's in place at a lot of other assessors offices um is that there's a there's an assessment method that looks at lots of sales across pretty wide areas, um, and then it uses averages in terms of say a dollar per square foot across a lot of homes that are sold in an area to come up with an estimate of value for for a, for a house that you're looking at. Um, but for those of those of us here from the Chicago area who are watching. Uh, we know that communities can be very different that are close by to each other and have very different markets, very different housing values. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, our, off, our office in the past that would look at transactions that took place in the south side between uh, 43rd Street and 63rd Street, which includes Hyde Park, but it also includes Woodlawn um, and North Kenwood and Bronzeville. And if you use the dollar per square foot that averaged every transaction that happened in those communities, you would end up undervaluing the wealthiest homes in, uh, in a place like Hyde Park. Um, and you'd end up overvaluing homes in places like Woodlawn and, um, and, uh, and Kenwoods. And this is this what Chris Berry at the University of Chicago, he's looked at studies across America. He thinks that this has been a big source of bias. So what we did is we we become much more sensitive to the actual location of the home and trying to assess it so we don't 
we don't project higher values from wealthier communities onto yeah. where 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 values are higher versus uh, communities where housing prices are lower in our in our assessment work uh, because we don't want people to be overburdened in, in their assessments. Um, and that has reduced, we think, by about 50% the bias that was there before for homes at the bottom end of the price spectrum. There's still some remaining bias that we see, and that's because we can't see inside people's houses that appraisal information that appraisers do see. They see inside people's houses. They see whether they had a renovation or not. We can't see it. And the we we when we're estimating the value of a house, we can get it within plus or minus thirty thousand dollars or so, but on a hundred thousand dollar house, that's not an acceptable amount of error. But that's the difference between a good kitchen that's been renovated and one that hasn't. Um, and so that that interior condition information is why we're working with the top fifteen assessors in the nation to get access to that federal mortgage appraisal database that Fannie and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have administered that the uh, the federal government oversees, and we went to the White House and said, hey, if you can open up these quality ratings inside houses, that would help us to reduce biases uh, that are embedded, we think, in, in valuations on homes at the bottom end of the spectrum. So we're working on this. It was very compelling. Um, we had the assessors from Philly and Detroit and LA, Dallas, uh, Miami. It was a bipartisan group of assessors all speaking in very uh, 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 vivid terms about the biases that they've experienced um, and seen in, in their work. We presented this to the Domestic Policy Council and this is an area where data, just better data, what could eliminate some of these biases, but also examining some of these modeling methods could also eliminate biases. But so I went on a little bit there, Eric, James, how do you think, uh, you know, Andre was talking about, you know, uh, biases and in methods and data, how do we how do we improve that? What are some solutions you guys have in mind? Well, uh, for some time now, um, the industry has moving towards these models, the AVMs, automated valuation models that you spoke about. Um, and for everyone out there, uh, one AVM is uh, one that we all know, which is Zillow, <laughs> right? Right, right, right. Okay. and and. I understand why some banks would want to use them. And it's simply because they have a large volume of paper to write, let's say. And I'm, I'm speaking street here, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. We like it that way because uh, the more real it is, the, the probably the more real it is. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and using these models, you know, they, they, they're accurate to a certain point. But when, when you get down, let's use your example, a house, they say is $100,000, 30% of it is, you know, is in the, is in the data. Um, that's a lot of money for somebody if they're trying to make a, uh, make a step, okay, in, in, in their finance, finance, finances or whatever. So you, you can't replace that appraiser to go in there, okay? Because there's going to be a difference. I know there's going to be a difference. And that's where you find the argument. You know, the difference. So let's not, let's not, um, from my standpoint, let's not hold, hold too tight to AVMs. Mm -hmm. You know, understand that they do have a purpose. And, um, um, but when, 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 when you're really talking about the accurate, assessment or valuation of your property you i, I strongly believe you need some eyes on it and yeah. eyes looking at the market now an, another thing um something that was said is that we have to grow the community uh, you, you know that that that's true I, i'm a developer and when you grow the community People want to move there. It's, there's a demand. Mm -hmm. And with that demand, we live in a capitalist society. Prices are going to go up because people want that. Okay. When we bring, think, look at it like this. 
you go in any black community, you're going to find people with the latest fashion, the, 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 the latest gadgets, vehicles, and whatever. Okay? But they have to go outside of that community to get it. So, you know, let's not be fooled. The money is in the community to grow the community. Okay? So we grow the community. People will want to move into the community and prices will go up. Now, it may push some people out, you know, but that's, that's, that's part of the evolution. Okay? Yeah. And um, let me touch on one, one other thing. W with regards to appraisers, um, I know the Appraisal Institute is taking this serious. On the national level, they have groups, uh, ongoing groups that are discussing this and trying to figure it out. And, uh, and I can say on the Chicago level, uh, at the executive board level, we have already established a committee on, on bias and we're rolling out with some homegrown programs to help, um, to help appraisers uh, ensure that they are not being racially biased when they go out. Um, you know what? Let me say this. I'm an appraiser. I'm in the inside. I can pick up the telephone and call anybody in the appraisal institute and ask them a question. That's just the, the nature, the culture of it, of the appraisal institute. And, it, and it's true because I've done it plenty of times. And people I don't even know, but I know that their background fits, you know, with what I'm looking for. We have that conversation and they share, they share readily. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that there's a, I, I like to believe that there is not a, a tremendous amount of appraisers out there that are intentionally trying to lowball property. I yeah, think it, I, what I think yeah. what goes to is education with the appraisers. I mean, we 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 have the um, we have the tools and the framework already in place. We just have to enforce it more. And believe me, I just took a class about two weeks ago. It's a continuing education class. And we talked about the level of penalties. Mm -hmm. The Appraisal Institute has in place uh, 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 measures to discipline, if not remove appraisers. And going back to what I said, and, I, and I'll keep saying it, everybody's looking at the same data. So if you got a problem, you can have somebody else look at it. And if the two don't come up with the same data, you get a third one. Mm -hmm. and they'll figure, I mean, within there. So um, I think um, I think I think I want to stop there and let somebody else chime all in. Right. Well, hey, who wants to chime in? I was thinking of of asking Alden and Andre. You might have had a chance to see uh, President Biden's uh, Secretary Fudge. She's the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. They have a project called the Pave uh, Group, looking at. Uh, um, patterns of disparities in valuation and appraisal. Um, what do you see from uh, what they've released so far? Do you think there are good solutions at the government level, federal government level to address some of these issues? Andre, Alden. Oh, oh, oh Alden, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with what okay. they've released. Uh, we, we did do some reporting about them forming uh, the group and what some of the things that they were aspiring to do. I, just to, the, the two cents I would offer on, on appraisal is uh, that we were hearing on the ground was just that the industry needs to diversify very clearly um, and that uh, a number of the issues that people here locally talked about, they felt was because uh, essentially they were white, white, white appraisers in black neighborhoods and they just lack a familiarity with uh, some of the assets of those communities, some of the assets of the individual properties mm -hmm. um, because they just weren't terribly familiar with them. And there were things that they they, they didn't see, they didn't recognize. And then there were things that they did see that that, that maybe uh, it gave them a perception that this was uh, a lower valued property or lower valued community. Um, and that's so there's some level of uh, education that needs to be there, but diversifying the field would be would go a long way to, to helping with that. Okay. Yeah. What about I, you, Andre? Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar um, with PAVE and um, a lot of it was built around my research. And 
I actually um, was part of um, the rollout in um, different cities. We're actually going to um, go to different markets and roll out the different components of it. Um, the meat of it is around um, a, a appraisers and and a lot of it is around the diversification of the workforce now um, and i said this before but i want to put a um an exclamation point on this i believe that the diversification of appraisers is a workforce issue it's a workforce issue which is an important issue but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will automatically get higher or better or more accurate appraisals by diversifying the field. It, it's, 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 you know, the bias at a personal level is certainly there. Other studies have found that, though the anecdotal data from the white um, individuals whitewashing their homes, as you mentioned, um, Fritz, removing all the pictures, books, um, hair products, clothes, and then getting a white stand in. And, and then when they get their second appra appraisal, it comes in, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars higher than Marin County is certainly a, mm -hmm. on the West Coast. That, that market is, is very high, but it's a $450,000 difference uh -huh. in, in, a, in a, an appraisal, which you're talking about, you know, a, intergenerational wealth and like unbelievable mm -hmm. and, and so certainly there's bias in that regard no question about it but it's the structures that are more problematic it's the lack of investment that is more problematic um because it takes it at a at a scale that's that gets to that 156 billion in lost equity that i described and that's just one, I mean, there's this, I mean, and there's many more wealth stripping sort of practices. You mentioned um, um, tax assessments. Um, I mean, there's all these things work together to effectively take money out of people's pockets and value out of their homes. And so um, I, I, I appreciate PAVE. I think it's a, a good step in the right direction. I'm working with PAVE and the Biden administration on these things. My goal is to then have um, that, an, that domino fall and move into other areas that the PAVE report identified. But the, the, it, it, so the two areas that needed the most teeth were not there. And that was around data. Mm -hmm. making these data accessible to government officials, researchers, journalists, and let's not forget um, homeowners and, and potential homeowners. There, I mean, people don't understand. There's no like central database that somebody can go to and say, oh, what's the average um, um, appraisal in this area. What you know, th there's just no assessment. Uh, but Andre, there is that database. The government just hasn't made it available. That, that, that's exactly right. I should I should be clear. <laughs> it's not accessible to the public, and we do know that Freddie and um, particularly Freddie, Freddie and Fanny, there's so much they can do around this data, and they're not. And yeah. and let's also not forget, banks have data as well. <laughs> That yes. they're 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 not um, releasing, so yes. um, no one's giving the data. But the, um, I, I, and there's another area that the PAVE report identifies, but it just needs legislation in order to pass, and that is regulation. The real estate industry as a whole is a self-regulated mark. I mean, uh, uh, entity, and so. I mean, there's there's certainly FCC, OCC, all these different things. But at the end of the day, the Appraisal Institute, the Appraisal Foundation it, are, are largely responsible for appraising. With, um, the um, um, National Association of Realtors, largely responsible for realtors. So, th there, so we got to figure out a way to bring some regulation and oversight in a way that makes sense so that when a problem, when so that we can actually hold 
entities accountable. Right now, it's just the only way to hold entities accountable is to sue them. And you don't want you don't want to get into a, just a litigious yeah. a litigious type of environment because that's just not the way. Yeah, and that gets to be a game too because people make settlements and the data is not available yeah. to everyone. You know, it's it got one of the solutions that we've all talked about to the what James was talking about, Andre and Alden. It's got to be transparency of the data that the government holds, right? To hold accountable lenders of all kinds, all the, all the participants in the valuation chain, the people who are lending money, the people who are making appraisals. Because what, what we found when we looked into this is that since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act under President Obama, there is actually a national database of every single mortgage that's guaranteed by the government done by government chartered corporations. So Andre was talking about Fannie and Freddie. Some, some of our viewers might not know who those are, but these are government chartered corporations. They have a charter from the government to, and the government backs up mortgages that they buy. The government guarantees their mortgages. And the government owns them now because they failed um, uh, about two decades ago and the government actually owns them. So they own this database. They own the database of over 100 million homes in America, every home that's been financed, refinanced, or new purchased. And that information is there. And under every mortgage, there is an appraisal, as James knows. Um, and um, we could open up this database and data scientists and journalists and policymakers and other in uh, academics, they could study these patterns to identify bias and it can help identify patterns. It can help identify good actors and bad actors. Um, and it would build accountability into the system. Um, and I, I do believe that the Biden administration and the PAVE work under Secretary Fudge is moving towards this. Like I, but we need to, all of us in our different ways, we need to, to maintain pressure on it so there is accountability. Um, and you know, I just want to note one other thing, one other solution that we see here um, James, Andre, and Alden, you talked about sort of access to financing, which is about basically the cost of ownership from a financial point of view when you buy something. What's the dollar cost of financing? Um, do you have access to the financing? Is the access to the financing equitable? Is the value of your home equitable? Um, we see another mechanism for reducing the disparity in uh, house values, which is higher taxes are a cause of lower values. Um, and I, we have a question from Shawanda here in the Q&A. She lives in the Austin community of Chicago and her taxes, her property taxes are 72% higher than her principal and interest on her mortgage. There are a lot of communities in the South suburbs of, of Cook County where it is very common for your tax bill to be higher than your mortgage payment. Wow. Um, so it is important that we talk about the cost of financing and access to financing, but it's also so important that we examine the, the, cause, the, the causes of unfairness and tax burdens, because when these taxes are high enough, they depress the value of people's homes. You know, if, you, if you're someone who bought a home in Harvey, um, which is a community just south of the border of Chicago, you own a $100,000 home in Harvey, the tax rate is six times what it is in across the border in Chicago. Um, and that is an incredible drag on the wealth of, a, of an honest person who bought their home in Harvey. And that is purely a product of how we finance schools in our state, because our state says that, okay, 75% of the cost of educating your children comes from property taxes generated in your community. And if you're Harvey, the, ho the housing values are very low. You've, you've had deindustrialization. Your shopping malls are not doing business anymore because of Amazon. But the, the unfairness that comes from all of this is telling communities like Harvey that you are on your own for funding the education of your children. Um, and so we think that one of the most positive things the government could do to stimulate housing values and wealth in black communities is to finance 
more of the education of children at the federal level. There's a federal government program called Title I that provides about 10% of the financing of American school districts. Um, but it's been stagnant. It was created under LBJ. It was part of the Great Society, part of the Civil Rights Movement. But it's been stagnant for over a decade. President Biden proposed doubling the spending on Title I from 15 to $30 billion. Um, that kind of stimulus would be very helpful in stimulating housing wealth in Black communities because every dollar that comes in from the federal government, theoretically, that's one less dollar that you need to tax on someone's property in a place like Harvey. And if you reduce tax burdens in Harvey, it'll be very stimulative to house prices in Harvey. And if someone has a mortgage that has a leveraged impact upward, you know, if so, if, if so, if that person in Harvey financed their home with an 80% mortgage and has 20% equity, and you take the tax burden off that home in Harvey and their value goes up 10%, that's very positive to their home equity. So we think the federal government, just by moving its little toe on Title I, you know, it gave $50 billion in subsidies to the airlines with COVID. Why not, uh, you know, put a fraction of that into our Title I education would be very stimulative to home equity. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Kelwin because we have yeah, some no, questions this from is, our this audience. Is great yeah, great discussion. I'm, I'm glad things got rolling. We're just getting really short on time. Uh, and I do, I want, I do want the audience to uh, participate. Yes, sir, you can chime in, James. May, may I chime in on that last part that the assessor said? You know, I've all, I run into that a lot with homeowners. Um, you know, I've always had to tell them that you know, the assessor's job is to assess your property correctly so the treasurer can bill you, okay? And what the treasurer is doing is paying out municipal services, okay? If you don't have the, the growth in that community, the community, uh, the commercial investment in that community, it, it puts it all on the rent. The burden falls on the residents to make sure those basic services are covered, you know? Um, and, and another thing, and I'm done, um, education is important. You know, I, I was pleased to hear Michigan's Governor Gretchen uh, uh, sign a law where before you leave high school, you have to take a finance course. Or you, there's a finance part embedded into their high school course, uh, 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 high school graduation requirement. Um, that's important because once, once people understand we, if we can get the children to understand this earlier, it will help uh, eradicate some of the bias from one perspective. Okay, that's all. Absolutely. No, really, really great points. And I think a really good segue. I'm just going to read a few uh, questions. Uh, many of these are, are actually uh, comments, but I think they all kind of tie in. Um, so Shawanda uh, says, I feel a solution will be to offer more community colleges uh, to add being an appraiser to their curriculum uh, so more black and brown communities can know it's a career uh, that can help us. So, you know, back to, to education and just making it more uh, readily available um, and in increasing the capacity of the, the industry. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of read some of these off. If anything is particularly salient, um, you know, feel free uh, as a panel to, uh, to chime in. Um, Nadine write, writes in the chat, I think it was to a, a comment that, uh, that, James was making kind of around, you know, how a, a appraisers uh, operate or, or function, um, having the ability, financial resources, um, you know, rehab loans, uh, home equity lines of, of credit to repair, maintain a home is part of the trap uh, that many black homeowners uh, find themselves in. So again, a comment, but it, you know, sort of speaks to, you know, a lot of black and brown communities don't, you know, have the same uh, capacity individual homeowners um, to sort of, you know, re re repair their homes or do some of those interior uh, repairs the assessor was talking about. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, add, adds to value, but it's again, more, um, you know, systemic uh, that, you know, that don't have the wealth in the, in the first place to, to maintain the homes at the same level and maybe, you know, quality uh, as other communities. Was that a part of your research, uh, Andre, or did you look at sort of um, uh, home quality uh, in comparing uh, neighborhoods? You're on mute still. Yeah, quality is a certain component of it. Um, one of the, the benefits of using Zillow data, you can get a better sense of quality, uh, quality per square foot um, using the, those data. But um, I mean, there, I, I'll say this, that the data, um, we have the data um, with 
um, to look at a lot of these issues, um, um, but there is devaluation. I, I will add this in a in during a time where our politics and our um, our, our um, parties are fractured. I think Fritz brings up a great point that this is an issue that cuts across race, class, um, political party. We should be going arm in arm because one of the questions that I'm seeing in the, um, the Q&A is who do we lobby to, to get this government data released? And this, this is gonna actually require a congressional act. It's gonna require legislation. And I really do believe if we're going to heal, um, it's not just gonna be about finding a, a policy fix. It will come that people are working together to find a policy fix. And when you can find assessors of different hues, of different political parties, different genders, um, you have uh, homeowners, you have journalists, you have researchers saying, hey, we want to find a solution, but we need the data, Freddie and Fannie. We, needed a, uh, we need a, a, a way that make this accessible for, the, for our publics. And I, I just really think that is a solution in itself. Because when we talk about these issues, it's so fractured <laughs> that yes. it, 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 it doesn't go anywhere. And so I think that this idea that we go together to lobby for data. And it might sound uh, kumbaya, uh, kumbaya but but there what other issue can you can you know know of that we're all impacted? Because I study black majority cities and look at the devaluation. Black people aren't the only people living in those cities. Black, I mean in, in those places, black people, white people, everyone, uh, lots of homes are devalued. And so Municipalities are losing money. States are losing money. Um, we're losing businesses because of it. Because most people start their businesses using the equity in their home. If you don't have equity, you don't have businesses. So for me, this is something we lose when we don't go arm in arm together to say we demand the data. I agree. Any thoughts there? Oh, call Peter Kellen. Oh, indeed. I mean, the the, the data. I, I think um, you know, I was talking about the uh, the uh, what we call the Humda data uh, being a way for us to kind of get a window into disparate lending. But the key question is how much is race a factor in those lending decisions? And we just don't know enough to say definitively, you know, how much of a factor it is. And to ultimately answer that question, we we need to know more data. We need to know more. And and the Humda has uh, expanded, so we know more now. Uh, than than we 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 did in the past. I think 2018, 2019 was a watershed year where there were there was an increase in in the variables that were included. I think we know debt to income ratio now, but but you know you know credit scores is is the the gold standard that everybody wants, and we still we still don't have that. Uh, but even without it, I think there's enough for us to to to, to press that there is there is something. Uh, uh, amiss uh, that 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 needs uh, some level of accountability, and as Andre said, we we the data will 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 help us get to that point. You know, on the on the point of accountability, let, let, let me say um, that there are measures in place when appraisers go rogue. Let's say, um, yeah, there, there there are measures in place. Now, have they been exercised? in the past that, you know, brought on all of this racial bias and, and, and everything. No, no, they have it. But um, there's an awareness right now, especially throughout the appraisal institute. And I think in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the states, especially in Illinois, that, you know, that's not gonna be tolerated and we're gonna try to eradicate it. It's like turning a big ship. You just can't all of a sudden just spin the wheel and it'll turn. It's gonna take some time. It's going to take some more realignment with education and everything, but it, it'll happen. And just, and I can't, I, I'm going to keep saying it. Everybody's looking at the same data. Yeah. So that's how you can actually catch somebody <laughs> who's doing it wrong. 
Yeah, okay. that's that's right, James. I got a good example, and I don't think he'll mind me outing it because he's tweeted about this. Our Speaker of the House, Chris Welch, here in Illinois, uh, he tweeted about the fact that, hey, I just got my assessment from the assessor's office. And yeah, just about matches what uh, Zillow says it's worth. The problem is I just tried to get my house refinanced uh, by Chase, and it was $100,000 lower than, than what uh, the assessor thinks my house is worth. So what's up with that? So <laughs> he said, we're going to shine a light on this in Illinois. Uh, if the federal government's not uh, moving on this, we are going to do that here for sure. And to, to Andre's point, I'll just add, you know, we've had a bunch of conversations with civic leaders uh, about getting that data. And a lot of people have expressed that they want to want to sign on. Uh, so just kind of appreciate that coalition building. And I think that's probably, you know, sort of the, the next leg uh, in this yeah. uh, in this fight is to, you know, bring in people uh, that aren't assessors, like you said, you know, just, you know, people that, you know, are, you know, heads of, you know, foundations or, um, you know, philanthropy and appraisers just, you know, because there's so many consequences uh, to, to this work. And that's what really excites me about doing it. Um, hey, I think we're at the point of, uh, of, of closing comments. There was one um, question that I wanted to, to pull out. It wasn't really a, a question, a, a, another one from Nadine. Um, but I'm just curious about it myself. You know, how do, how do uh, vacant lots uh, factor into to value, uh, into uh, appraisals? Uh, you know, it's not, that's not the property itself, but the overall community, um, you know, whether it be from the assessment side, uh, the, the appraisal side, or even, you know, in, in the research that, um, that's been done. Um, how, does, how does that impact and what are some, you know, strategies to kind of address um, vacancy? Because you can have beautiful homes uh, in, in areas, you know, particularly, you know, like, you know, Bronzeville or, you know, parts of the city that, you know, the interiors are amazing. They've done a lot of work in them, but the, the community itself, um, you know, has a lot of vacancies. What are some of the impacts there? Well, actually, I don't know offhand if we're, if our modeling team in, in our data science team, if they use the presence of vacant lots nearby in estimating the value of people's homes. That's a good question that we're going to get back to you, Nadine. We're going to get back to all the listeners here um, uh, because uh, I'd be interested to know that basically what our data science team does is they look at as many variables as they can measure and they try to find relationships between sales. And they look at a lot of things. They look at the presence of flooding risk. They look at the change in flooding risk. They look at noise levels. They look at uh, our uh, accessibility of CTA, of bus stops, of school districts. We try to look at all the variables we can and see if there are any meaningful relationships. Uh, we'll see if we think the presence of more vacant lots in a community has a meaningful relationship on price. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but what I will tell you is that we are trying to make sure that the vacant lots are valued properly in line with market. If we undervalue vacant lots in our assessment system, we're basically going to be rewarding vacancy and penalizing people who are occupying their homes or businesses and building on it. So that is something that we do not want to do. My predecessor in this office, they gave reductions of up to 90% on the value of commercial properties if they were vacant, which was basically a way of incentivizing vacancy, which was hollowing, hollowing, hollowing out the backbones of, of our communities. So, you know, I, I grew up in the South side and I love the South shore community, but the 71st street, we talked to the local chamber there, there was a huge amount of vacancy taking place because they thought that there were out of town landlords stashing land, land banking, um, and not faithfully occupying the space. And our assessment methods were basically putting all the burdens on the people faithfully staying open while rewarding the people who are staying vacant. So, and we don't think that reflects actual market practice. If you keep a property vacant, its value does not fall 90%. It will fall some fraction of that. So what we did is we changed the method to say, we're gonna give credit to all commercial properties on a corridor with the neighborhood vacancy rate. And if you're gonna claim additional vacancy, you'll get a fraction of the additional amount of vacancy just for two years. Um, and you have to apply for it each year. And then after that, uh, we're not going to give it to you anymore because maybe someone else who wants to fill it up um, can. Um, yep. So that's our policy. That's why Trump Tower's valuation went up here um, uh, because uh, uh, you know we weren't going to give the, the lavish rewards for vacancy like they they got under my predecessor. Um, but these that's just an example, um, uh, Nadine. So we want to make sure we answered your question. Um, 
So why don't we, uh, we also, why don't you also that? asked about taxes and the treasurer also can help with that because if someone has not paid taxes on a lot, the treasurer is responsible for clearing the tax debt there, which is a whole other question that we don't deal with in the assessor's office. Okay, why don't we pivot to closing remarks, Fritz? Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Someone asked me for um, previous conversations on racial equity, kind of where does our series live? Uh, there's lives on our website, so I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. This one will also be there uh, summarily, so uh, you can uh, you can find that there soon. I'll also leave my information uh, in the chat. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, anything we didn't get to, uh, I can definitely get that to our panelists. Um, anything internally in the assessor's office, of course, I can help answer those kinds of questions. Yeah. So, yeah, and and, and we'll, wherever the recording of this recording will live, we'll make sure we have an answer to Nadine's question there too. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so perfect. So why don't we go to closing remarks? I think Andre needs to jump off in about five minutes. So maybe we should start with him. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate what I said before. I think this is an opportunity for communities to come together. Let's rally um, together to get the data so that we can use it to enact change. Um, thank thank Cook, uh, Cook County for inviting me and I'm looking forward to working with you in, in the future. Sounds good, Andre. Alden? Uh, I just wanted to speak on what I think is part of the kind of the structural uh, issue here. Um, and that is around, um, around segregation. Um, and I'll break that down a little bit by saying essentially the ways in which white residents shun neighborhoods as the population, particularly of African-Americans increases or uh, neighborhoods that, that are African-American. Uh, there have been studies done uh, or surveys done where they asked black, white, and Latinos around what kind of neighborhood would they like to live in. And everybody talks about in responding to those questions, they would be happy living in a diverse community. No problem at all. But when you actually look at the numbers where borrowers actually seek loans, white borrowers overwhelmingly are looking for, for homes in white communities, very seldom looking for homes in black or in brown communities, whereas black and, and brown borrowers, generally speaking, are looking for homes across the board. Uh, when we take a look at Chicago as a classic case of, of, of white flight, the city has, throughout its history, particularly since the Great Migration, there have been all of these shifts in our schools, in our neighborhoods, even in our shopping malls. When black uh, faces show up, white faces leave. And so that is the that is kind of underneath our market. And so when you have the most most uh, well suited economically um, community stunning other communities as the level of black uh, black faces, black residents, so on and so forth grows, then that inherently uh, devalues those communities. and I think all of the things that we're talking about in terms of ways to uh, address the devaluing of black neighborhoods, if those neighborhoods, if those shopping malls, if those schools, if, if everything, um, if, if white residents in the Chicago market continue to shun black spaces, black spaces will always be uh, to some degree burdened by that. And I'm not sure how we address that, but I think that is kind of the elephant in the room uh, that, that, that needs to be dealt with in some form or fashion as we talk about these issues. Absolutely. James, you want to close us out here? Um, yeah, let, me, let me say a, a couple things. Um, one, there was a question in the, uh, I think it was a question raised about having more schools teach appraisal uh, courses, um, you know, there's 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 a bigger there's a bigger issue to that, you know, and and this is what I tell a lot of people that that look to me and ask me about being an appraiser. I say, you know, your first two years as being an appraiser, you'll probably make more money working at Walmart than you will be an appraiser. The way they got the 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 the, the entry into being an appraiser, I mean, and it's the same for everyone. Okay, it's the same for everyone, and everybody take the same classes. It, the way they have it set up, 
it, it, it sort of uh, deterred people from coming into the industry, okay? But what I tell them, once you get in, and after you're in in about two, two and a half years, because that's how long it's going to take you to get certified, where you can sign off on, all, on, your, own, on your own work, sign off on your own work, you're golden. Because, you know, I look at all of the, the, the data about appraisers throughout the country, especially as the members of the Appraisal Institute. And the number of appraisers coming in is going down. And the number of appraisers uh, um, leaving is going up. And that's primarily the older appraisers leaving. But there's few, few people coming in, and it's because of the way it's set up. Now, uh, we're looking at ways of trying to, uh, when I say we, the Appraisal Institute is looking at ways of how to best, uh, uh, um, how to make changes to, uh, to address this. Um, but once you get in, you're golden. And uh, being an appraiser, you, you, you can make a good salary. I'm going to admit, you can make a good salary. Um, so, you know, Think about it. And I tell everybody, think about it, get into it. Um, and it's good. Um, we, we talked about growing communities and I, I'm speaking from a real estate valuation perspective. We talk about growing communities, you know? Yeah. And, and I would say, generally speaking in black communities, they have the worst schools. Okay. That's the problem. And that's a problem at the state level and at the city level and at the municipal level to make sure that you're giving quality education to your to your to your to your residents. OK, but, you know, we 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 also need to bring in those those uh, 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 amenities, community amenities that that drive demand for that area. You know, the entertainment. Think about it. Now, I said it earlier. We go outside of the community to get our, you know, our goods and services and little trinkets or whatever, buy cars. So that means the money is in the community. We just need to do more community investment. And, well, that's going to drive up home prices. And like I say, it may displace some people, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's par for the course, I guess. Well, James, you, you, that's a good point to lead into me, and then I'll sign us off here. Uh, I wrote a book chapter last year. Uh, for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's called um, uh, The Right to the City. Uh, and Kelwin can put a, can can uh, paste it in there because it really addresses one of the greatest biases of all, which is that our whole system of financing schools is geared towards one part of the economy that's based on brick and mortar, people's housing equity and investing in the kinds of businesses you're talking about, James. But there's this whole other part of the economy that gets a pass from paying for our schools, the digital economy, um, the service economy. Um, and this, in, you know, when I wrote the book, you know, when COVID was just getting started, we could see the dramatic effects it was having. You know, we're doing this meeting via Zoom. I don't know if Illinois gets any revenues from uh, taxing the income that Zoom makes. Zoom has income. Uh, but it is displacing the activity that used to take place in a hotel ballroom uh, or some other venue where we might be meeting to have this panel discussion. And it's an example of the kind of restructuring of, of our economy that's taking place that's going to generate more inequities if we don't address it. Uh, because that investment that you're talking about, James, that is so important to sustaining wealth in communities is going to get harder because the, the shoulders of brick and mortar that are expected to carry the cost of financing the education of our children are going to get narrower. Well, there's this whole other part of the economy that's generating income and revenues that that doesn't have that burden. Um, and so I think the who's in the best position to tax that activity is the federal government. And they're also the best, act, best position to finance education. And so I think we need to have more of a conversation to have more equity in this country on financing things like schools through taxing incomes rather than taxing people's brick and mortar wealth. Brick and mortar wealth is what creates vitality in communities. It creates a sense of place. Um, it, you know, small businesses are the backbones of our community. They generate employment. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's another reckoning that I think we have to have. So everyone there, you've been really great. 
this is to be continued. Um, this is just the latest in a series of conversations. We really appreciate you and J you, James and Alden and Andre, who was with us and all the listeners out there uh, for being with us on this evening. You could be in a lot of different places, but check back with us. This is a continuing series where we like to focus on issues and solutions. Uh, and we welcome you back again, guys. Thank you.